Howdy folks, welcome to FinOps for Finance. This week, I'm going to introduce what's going to be happening over the next five weeks where we're talking about getting FinOps certified. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be covering, today I'm going to be going over the principles and personas, so the why and the who of FinOps. Then the week after, I'll go through the phases and maturity. So the different different phases that you might be in your FinOps journey within your organization or within your practice. Then I'm going to go through capabilities. So there's two. Um, I've just broken down into two sections because there's a lot in there, and a lot of the exam when it when it does happen will be will be focused around these capabilities. Um, and then I'm going to go through the actual exam itself. So what's the structure of it? What I would recommend to prepare for it other than going going over the, this material I'm going to cover. Um, all this information is available at, at a more granular level on the FinOps website. I will link to this in the in the notes as well. So you have that. Um, I'm just going to go through it on a, on a kind of high level, each one, so that you've got a flavor for what they entail before, before digging deeper into the material. So first up today, we have principles and personas. So the why and the who of FinOps. Um, I'll just call out the slides. I've kind of gone a bit more jazzy this week. So if, they, if they're if they a bit much, um, you prefer the old basic slides or you're happy with this fire slash torn page thing, um, let me know. Um, I'll do either more or less, depending on, depending on what I hear back. Um, so the principles of FinOps, why do we FinOps? And again, this is kind of a cornerstone of FinOps, so it's going to be a cornerstone of the exam itself. Um, the first one is around collaboration. Um, so FinOps is all about driving that collaboration between finance, tech, product, and the business teams to work together in almost real time to kind of maximize the return on your investment from the cloud. You're looking to continuously improve your engagement and your discussion so that it's kind of almost like a rising tide lifts all boats. So if everyone is connected and plugged in, you're learning from each other, you get an optimal FinOps outcome then. So that's what we're, that's what FinOps is aiming to do, one of the principles of it. The second one is that this isn't decisions driven by business value. So what is business value? A lot of this stems from a concept called unit economics, which will the, the material goes into in a lot more detail. But effectively, it's the, an example is the number of users supported by an application, how much does it cost? So if you've got a million users, how much does it cost to run the cloud to service those million users? So if you go from 1 million to 10 million users, you expect these costs to go jump 10x but it's good because you're getting 10x revenue from those same customers. So it's being able to understand that if cloud cost goes up, it's not necessarily a bad thing if it's linked to a revenue generating number. Um, so that that's something to, to understand. Value also, there's this concept called the iron triangle, um, which I covered in the material, where there's always a trade-off in everything, I suppose, between cost, quality, and speed. So you can have the most expensive, quickest machine, or the the best quality, quickest machine, but it's going to be expensive. Um, would be would be one one example. Or you could have a cheaper machine that's of lower quality and not as fast. And that's a a trade off and a discussion that must be had within that collaboration piece, which is linked above. So it's all it all kind of ties in ties in together. Um, but that's a another kind of key aspect of it. Another one is ownership and accountability. So you'd hear about pushing this concept of pushing accountability to the edge of the organization. So what does that actually mean? Um, it means that engineers, um, when they're, and architects, when they're, when they're building these applications within your company's environment, anytime they write a line of code to access a cloud resource in um, over the internet, it is generating a line item on your bill. So by building up a level of understanding um, with with them that they understand the responsibility and the accountability of what what they're coding, the impact that that has in a dollars from a dollars and cents perspective is a really important piece. 
this kind of ties into a lot of the reporting that's done as well, where you're looking at a concept called chargeback and showback. So this is where you get a, a big cloud bill at the end of the month. And what you need to do is you need to divide that up between the various departments, depending on what they've used. Um, you'll hear of concepts like tagging, where different departments are accounts that engineers use are tagged by their department. So you can effectively just filter for that department and say, this department used these resources, this is their cost at its simplest terms. That's that's how that, that works. Um, the accessibility and timeliness of, of the data as well kind of links in nicely because to anytime you spin up a resource in a cloud, you're being charged by the second, by the minute, by the hour. Um, so any improvement that you can make right now, um, you get the benefits, the compounding effects of that benefits every second, minute, hour after that. So there's no real point in reporting on this stuff quarterly, saying, lads, for the last three months, you could have had a different, a cheaper machine in a cheaper region doing the same job, and it would have saved you X amount of money. It's like closing the gate after the horse is bolted. It doesn't It doesn't make sense. So you need to have a tighter feedback loop. The benefit of having this kind of tighter feedback loop as well is that if you have a discussion with the engineering team about making an optimization change, if they make the change in week one, you look at their numbers in week two and they can see that they've made that change and they get immediate feedback that that change has delivered X number of dollars savings. So it's it kind of builds that perpetual flywheel effect of continuous improvement. So they make the improvement, they see the results, they make a further improvement and so on and so forth. Um, the next one is around a centralized team. Oh, sorry, before I go back. The back to says one last thing I didn't mention here is about trending and variance analysis. Like as well as comparing your own department week over week, month over month, based on the initiatives you've taken. You can compare across departments as well. You can say Department A did a modernization of their storage. Um, they went from G2 to G3, um, which is a concept we'll get to later. Um, and they saved 50K a month. Then Department B might think, oh, we could do that. And we would save something, something similar depending on our usage. So it kind of allows having that, um, that comparison as well. To, to kind of drive internal benchmarking and best practice across the org, um, which feeds into the central team, which is the, the department or the team that pulls these metrics together, drives a consistent reporting framework across the different PUs. Um, it would be one element of this team, but another, and, and kind of, I suppose, building that, educating the engineers and architects about the, I suppose, the, the, the additional responsibilities that are there as well as running good applications. Um, but they also build a FinOps culture with that continuous flywheel improvement piece. Um, and the commitment management is, is massive as well. So um, or might, you might also hear it called rate optimization. So this is where you um, the central team is responsible for managing um, commitments such as savings plans, reserved instances, CODs, which are committed use discounts in, in Google Cloud. Um, they manage these centrally to look at the entire environment, not just one single business unit, and by the right commitment mix and level to maximize returns, minimize risk, um, and, and that by having that single 10,000 view purview, um, they can make a better, better decision as opposed to each individual team managing their own, own commitments. Um, then we have the leveraging the variable cost model of the cloud. So the beauty of the cloud is that you could try things, the risk of failure it, or, or trying things is quite low uh, compared to what it would have been historically. So back in the day, um, engineers would have to request a um, capacity in a data center. So they might need to order a server which gets shipped taking three to six months then it will rise in their data center. Someone has to rack and stack it, and then they can access that resource to work on the project that they wanted to work on. Whereas now they can just 
spin up a machine with a couple of lines of code, try out what they need to try out, and, and then iterate and improve from there. So that's the beauty of it, but it needs to be managed in terms of if we're trying this stuff, we need to turn it off after, um, is, is an example of, of something that it's great to try, but we need to have the guardrails in place to, to spin those things back down after we've run the experiments, ran the tests. Um, and by using the variable cost models, we can try tweaks and improvements. So you can try different machine types, different regions, and the, the risk and the friction involved in making those changes is more minimal. Um, so that's everything around the FinOps principles, which again is a is a course why why we FinOps. Um, so that would form a, a central part to to the exam. Um, and like I said, I'll put a link to the specific page in the in the notes for this one. The next one is the FinOps personas. So this is the who FinOps, who FinOps is. Is that a word? Um, so this is where uh, the various people that are involved that have a stake in in FinOps. Um, the first is leadership. So we'll start with the very the top dogs. Um, so they are they're the budget holders. So if things are gone massively over budget, they need to um they're kind of held accountable as to why why that is. And they need to ensure that their teams are being effective with the resources that are in place. Um, so they would have probably overview reporting from, from FinOps. They might give a summary of what the various departments are doing. They feed that to leadership. If there's initiatives they're trying to get buy-in for, FinOps team will feed that up to leadership who push it down across the organization to make sure it happens um, because the book essentially stops with them. Um, next, we have the business and the product owners. So their main focus is to quickly bring new products and features to the market. So if you've got a software product with different features, um, keeping that updated and modernized and offering new the new shiny thing, whether it be AI or, or whatever, whatever it might be, um, that is their, their key um, aim. But a, an element of that is having it having an accurate price point for these additional features for when it's brought to market. And that's where FinOps plays a key role in that unit economics piece. What does it cost to support 1 million users? Or um, we, we need to have that, that figure locked down, have an understanding of how we can maybe improve it because every improvement we make to that unit economic um, figure improves our margin. Because if we sell it for X and our unit economics is Y, the bit in the middle is where we get paid. That's that's a profit. Um, so that's a key piece that they need to understand and be able to influence. Um, next, we have the finance folk. Um, so these are required to, to ac accurately budget and forecast and report on their cloud costs. Is there is there key um, raison d'etre, so so to speak? Um, if Budgets are running wild. The CFO is going to want to know why. If our forecasts are off, we'll need to have a decent explanation as to why that has happened. Um, this is where the an element of the cloud and, and FinOps comes in. And it's called chargeback and showback, um, where we take our single cloud bill, as I explained previously in the, the principles piece, and break it down to the relevant business unit. So um, finance need to understand why a engineering's um, portion of cloud bill has gone up or down by a certain portion. Is it something that's in their control, out of their control? That's um, a, a key element that, that finance are, are involved in. Next, we have procurement. Um, so procurement, their um, main interest in the FinOps space is around the cloud platform relationship management. So that's um, the relationship with the whatever public cloud provider um, you may be using. Um, the reason for this is they will be looking to, um, whether it be every one year or three year, sign a deal with these cloud providers um, to get a, a blanket discount on their um, on our bill. And this is used by um, getting a figure called a commitment figure. So this is where you would say to a cloud provider, I commit to spend $10 million with you, Mr. Cloud Provider or Mrs. Cloud Provider over the next three years. If you, and because I'm going to commit to spending that amount over the next three years, you're going to give me a discount of X, whatever it is. So the bigger your commit number and the longer period of time, 
the bigger percentage discount you're going to get. So procurement's interest is in understanding what's the maximum commitment level we can sign up to without being overly aggressive. Because if we commit to that, in that example, a 10 million commitment over three years, and we only spend 8 million over three years, we have a shortfall of 2 million that we need to essentially cut a check to the cloud provider for that difference, or else find a way to make up that that shortfall. Um, so that's why procurement have a keen interest in what what FinOps are, are doing. Last but certainly not least is the engineering team. So they're the reason any of us are doing any of this stuff in the first place. So they deliver fast and high quality services to the organization. That's what, what they do. So they're, if something falls over, that's on them. They need stuff to be rock solid and running um, and to fix any bogus that may come up so that it's a seamless experience for, for the users across the org. And that that's where an element of that, that trade-off again and that iron triangle comes in about whether it's quality, cost, or speed. So obviously the engineers want the very best machines, but they might be um, more expensive and it, it's just kind of understanding that understanding that balance and that's just a small element of what the engineers do it's a bit of a black box to me but uh, some really smart folks doing some really smart things is uh, is the height of it I think um, so to summarize to recap um, we covered the principles and the personas and these are kind of key elements within within the exam itself um, the principles is because it's the why and the personas, there'd be questions around the different um, perspectives of the different people. Why are they interested in FinOps would be an example of the kind of question you might get asked there. Um, the next up will be the phases in the maturity model of, of FinOps. So I'm going to cover that next week. Um, and that's that's all I had. Um, if you have any questions, feel free, free to drop a note in the comments, like and subscribe, tell a friend, all that sort of stuff. And I'll chat to you all soon.